Thank you so much for coming to today's seminar, The Power of Advocacy, which is uh, hosted by the Bloomberg American Health Initiative. I'm Marianne Amos, the Director of Communications at the Initiative, um, and I'm really thrilled to welcome our two speakers here today, Oying Ramon and Beth Frederick. Um, Oying and Beth are going to be reviewing the rich history of advocacy here at the Bloomberg School of Public Health, and they'll be delving into the exciting future of public health advocacy. They'll discuss the different levels of policy at which advocacy can have an impact and what makes policies effective. Oying and Beth will also share important lessons learned from their own dynamic careers in public health advocacy. So they're going to kind of trade back. So I'm going to introduce both of them and then Oying is going to kick things off. Um, Jose Oying Ramon is the director of the Bill and Melinda Gates Institute for Population and Reproductive Health here at the Bloomberg School and the founding co-director of the Center for Public Health Advocacy. Also, thank you to the Center for Public Health Advocacy for um, working with us on this seminar. Just a quick shout out. Oying is also a senior scientist with the Department of Population, Family and Reproductive Health, an internationally recognized leader in family planning. Oying brings more than 30 years of leadership experience in public health to this role. He has designed, managed, and evaluated more than 300 advocacy, behavior change, and knowledge management projects in Asia, Africa, and the Near East in such areas as population and reproductive health, maternal and neonatal health, women's empowerment, and numerous others. From 2008 to 2012, Oying was a senior officer in the Global Health Policy and Advocacy Group of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, covering the issues of family planning, maternal, neonatal, and child health, and nutrition. He was one of the key planners of the 2012 London Summit on Family Planning. Prior to joining the Gates Foundation in 2008, Oying was a founding member and the senior deputy director of the Bloomberg School Center for Communication Programs, or CCP, where he led health behavior and knowledge management programs around the world. He was also director of the Health Communication Partnership, or HCP, USAID's flagship health and behavior global program. And Beth Frederick. Beth is the executive director of the Advanced Family Planning Advocacy Initiative of the Gates Institute for Population and Reproductive Health here at the Bloomberg School and the co-director of the Center for Public Health Advocacy. She's also a senior associate with the Department of Population, Family, and Reproductive Health. She's worked with the Johns Hopkins University Center for Communication Programs, the International Women's Health Coalition, and the Guttmacher Institute. She was a Bell Fellow at Harvard University, an adjunct faculty with New York University's Robert F. Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. She serves on the boards of IBIS Reproductive Health and Empower, a grant-making organization focusing on youth programs in emerging markets. Within AFP, she supports Bangladesh, Burkina Faso, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Senegal, Tanzania, and Uganda. We are very lucky to have the two of them here speaking with us today, so please welcome our speakers. Thank you, uh, Marianne, and thank you for all of you to come here, including those who are uh, live streaming with us. Welcome uh, to the talk. I was told that I can't walk around this way, so I'll have to stay here. So you understand, I like to normally walk around. But because we're being live streamed, I have to stay uh, here in the podium. So before I s uh, speak, I just want you to know it took... Uh, I think about 30 years, and I've been long at Hopkins uh, for a Center for Public Health Advocacy to be actually set up here. Discussions even started during the time of Dee Henderson, right? Dee Henderson, who kind of just eliminated uh, uh, smallpox, and yet that center, for various reasons, has never been created, even though we have a long, long, rich history of public health advocacy as an institution. And let me just take you through about one, two, three, four, five points in time. Uh, I could make it a thousand points in time uh, to show you the rich history of the school and public health advocacy. So if you look at this um, uh, timeline, uh, You probably uh, uh, know who Evie McCollum is, the person who discovered vitamin A and D, right? So as 
between 1922 and 1946, um, Dr. McCollum had columns at McCall Magazine to translate the mysteries of laboratory into kitchen commonplaces. Can you just imagine the top scientists in the world having a column in a women's magazine? That would have been a complete no-no at the time. But because he was so advanced in his own thinking and his own research, he did that, even probably at the price or the cost of being ridiculed by his fellow scientists, right? So we have a long, long history. Uh, as you know, um, Dr. McCollum was a pioneer in collaborative approaches to research, especially bringing together the medically and biochemically oriented scientists in the school. He was the first to, scientist to use a rat colony for nutrition research, a methodological innovation at the time which helped discover vitamin A and D. Now, if we second timeline there, um, Alzheimer and vitamin A, and you probably as uh, public health uh, experts uh, know about this, right? Um, when our own Alzheimer started his research, and vitamin A was focused on um, preventing blindness, night blindness. And yet, serendipity occurred. It turns out that the same intervention, supplementation of vitamin A among children, could actually reduce under child mortality between 23 to 34%. A stunning finding at that uh, point in time. And again, here, uh, from research to policy and to programs, you probably see vitamin A supplementation in the world right now. It all started here, from research to policies to programs to practice. Okay? And then the third uh, example there, and this is also related to Al, is uh, some of you may have attended the powerful conversations I had with him about two weeks ago as part of the Global Accelerate, Accelerator Leadership Program. So I asked him a, a, a question. I said, how did you convince a Michael Bloomberg to invest in public health? So for, you, for those of you who were not there, let me just summarize um, what he said. Uh, this is a brilliant pitch that I will continue to use every time I speak. So what essentially he said, and I'm paraphrasing here, is that he said that uh, no amount of investment that you would make in a school of medicine or even in a hospital could equal the millions of lives saved than when you invest in a school of public health, essentially when you invest in public health. And Michael Bloomberg said, oh, you mean saving lives millions at a time, right? That became the slogan of the school. But what a pitch, right? Because the hospitals are one patient at a time, but public health is saving lives, protecting health millions at a time. And then in 2016, after a series of presentations that I and Beth and David Jernigan made to the powers that be at Hopkins, finally um, in 2016, after more than maybe two years of preparation, uh, finally the Center for Public Health and Advocacy was created here. And I can talk about that towards the end of my presentation here after Beth takes over. And then of course, um, the key to this is that when Dr. McKenzie took over as Dean, she included advocacy as the fifth pillar of the strategy of the school in the next 10 years. This is a recognition of how advocacy evolved over a long period of time in an institution like ours. For a long time, nobody wants to touch advocacy. Why? Because a lot of scientists here simply feel that if you move into the terrain of advocacy, you are not going to be perceived as scientists anymore. So that was kind um, of the fear. But we have a long, long history of major wins in public health um, advocacy. And let me take you through, um, through some of them. There are many, plenty. So um, 
think about just close your eyes and imagine there is a television ad, you know, which shows children happily playing in the swimming pools, public, public swimming pools all over the U.S., right? And then all of a sudden, right? And then they can't do that anymore. You go back to the 1940s and the 1950s. Why they can't do that? Why? Because of fear of polio. In the olden days, pools are being cleaned through completely changing the water or through filtration methods. But in um, those were in the 1930s and 40s. But later on, when um, we discovered um, chlorine use, it eliminated polio as a public health uh, hazard. So just imagine that, okay? We just take for granted going to public pools now because we don't fear this anymore. That's public health, the power of public health for you. Uh, the second example I have is seat belts. Why do we have to wear seat belts? Why is a law? Everybody does that here in the U.S. and all over the world. Why? That the research and the evidence base for that was actually done at Hopkins. Extensive research done with the Center for Injury Research and Policy in the 1970s led to an introduction of seatbelt laws and widespread campaigns that brought seatbelts in vogue and helped it to become essentially the norm today. Do you know that? That Hopkins was involved in that? Isn't that amazing? That seatbelts, which we take for granted now, actually came from the research, you know, done at one of the centers here. In sometime in the late 80s, um, Harvard, J. Winston in particular, at the Center for Health Communication at Harvard under their alcohol project, were trying to think of what is it that could, they could have an impact, especially on um, alcohol abuse, right? And they came up with a brilliant campaign called the Designated Drivers Campaign. And based on research, based on the experience in Scandinavia, and they adopted it in the context of the US and worked with all the Hollywood producers and embedded it in many of the entertainment education vehicles, you know, that were either on television or on radio or on um, in the movies, right? So now we just laugh about it. You're the designated driver, don't drink. It's a social norm. But there was actually evidence behind that, and there was a campaign to make that essentially a social norm. You know? So that was done by Harvard successfully. Later on, when I was talking to them many years ago, I said, how come that was their only success and nothing more, right? And they said they did another one, which was to prevent violence, among, among, especially among children, and they called it the Squash It campaign. It didn't fly, you know. So sometimes you can succeed, but sometimes you also fail, okay. And then uh, I just want to take you through uh, the thousand days, okay, because I was personally involved in this. When I was uh, the th th first thousand days in nutrition, okay. So when I was at the Gates Foundation, um, I led the policy and advocacy team for nutrition, including MNC AIDS and uh, family planning. And as part of the nutrition team, we came out with a new five-year strategy at the time. And my fellow um, uh, office mates, one of them is, was actually a professor here at uh, Hopkins. He was a senior program officer at the time at the Gates Foundation. We came up with a new nutrition strategy, which essentially is the first thousand days, that window of opportunity where you can intervene, right? And so they said, oh, Ying, you're very good at this. Why don't you be the one to find a title for what this entire strategy is going to be called? So I said, give me two days and let me think about it. So I read out all the voluminous data, scientific data. And I said, I got it, guys. I said, let's call it the, the, the first thousand days. And my friends and colleagues said, Oh, Ying, that doesn't sound technical. This is a technical, very technical, very scientific strategy. 
if you call it the first thousand days, it loses the technical power of all the, the evidence and the data. So I said, you ask me to do it. I call it the first thousand days. Essentially, we didn't call it the first thousand days strategy. But be, me, being a policy and advocacy person, I didn't listen to my colleagues and made my first grant in nutrition to set up the launching of the first thousand days. Gave money to Interaction, which is the organization which work with all the NGOs in the Washington kind of Beltway area, right? I called them up and I said, let's launch the first thousand days and I will give you the money if uh, you can help me raise another equal amount of money that we can get from somebody else. I said, well, we don't know how to raise that. So I called a friend of mine who was head of the friend of, the, of Bread for the World and I said, you're in the nutrition space and I think you know personally the chief of staff of Hillary Clinton. I said, you owe me one. Can you give her a call? I need some money from the Walmart Foundation, right? To match the money I'm going to give to Interaction. And that actually happened. And we launched for the first time the, the Thousand Days Movement with Hillary Clinton, I think with the Deputy Prime Minister of the UK and the Prime Minister of Australia, you know, at the time at one of the UN General Assembly meeting. So what is the first uh, Thousand Days, which is being legislated all over the world now? In many countries around the world, there are legislations to implement the first thousand days. It is that window of opportunity between from pregnancy, essentially the first and second year of life. The intervention has to be done at that point in time because if you do it beyond that window, you actually have no impact. The, um, the damage has been done and can cause irreversible damage to a child's growing brain affecting his or her ability to do well in school, earn a good living, and making it harder for the child and her family to rise out of poverty. It can also set the stage for later obesity, diabetes, and other chronic diseases, which can lead to a lifetime of health problems. So many of us think that school feeding is the best nutrition intervention. No, that's too late. It has to be within that first thousand days. And if you attended the presentation of um, the Mystifying the Gates Foundation, I think about three weeks ago here, Parol Christian, who was a former professor who joined the nutrition team of the Gates Foundation, and said, we're even much more focused on upstreams. While we still support the first thousand days, our intervention and our investment is really in the first 500 days. That's where the real critical intervention is going to happen from our point of view, because that's where the evidence um, is. So let me, uh, let me stop there in terms of just bringing you through all of this rich history of victories in public health that we played a role, the school played a role, uh, except for the Harvard one. And uh, I'll get back later on, but I would like to invite uh, Beth to in the public health advocacy practice. So you're going to hear some familiar themes between Oying's presentation and mine. I want to first say hi to all the Bloomberg American Health Initiative fellows who are online listening to us here. I know from your bios that many of you have advocacy embedded in everything you do. And so so please forgive us if we're, we're coming down to some, some things you already know, but maybe you'll get a few, a few tips along the way about advocacy. So for those of you in the room and also online, my first question is, do you consider yourself, I thought he moved my slide. Do you consider yourself as a public health professional to be an advocate? A little over six years ago, Oying and I um, when we were thinking about um, starting the Center for Public Advocacy here in earnest, we interviewed faculty across the school to see how they, they saw their advocacy role and whether they considered themselves advocates. Many, like Nobel Prize winner Peter Agree, admitted it proudly. He was very proud that he had testified in front of the Minnesota legislature. Others were a little more reticent. Fast forward today, and as, as Oying said, advocacy is a core competency for our students, 
and we have a strong advocacy pillar in the deans and the school's strategic plan. And the science, practice, and teaching of advocacy has become a discipline worthy of the academy. Even still, many people wonder, is advocacy for me? Will my scientific integrity or reputation be compromised? Do I have what it takes to be an advocate? Well, you have nothing to fear, is my main message. The simple answer is you go back to basics, like definitions. Advocacy is defined as the act or process of supporting a cause or proposal, while also considering alternatives. Sound familiar? Its cousin pol is policy, and it's a course or method of action or a high-level overall plan. Within these definitions, it's not hard to see that you're already advocating when you work with a government institution, uh, develop a grant proposal, or focus and plan for a new project. There's nothing different between those processes and the process of advocacy. Recently, colleagues from the London School for Hygiene and Tropical Medicine may have characterized the advocacy imperative best when they wrote that since the advocacy, since the impact agenda is unlikely to recede anytime soon, our best response as a profession is to interrogate it, shape and frame it, and to help us all find ways to navigate the complex practical, political, moral, and ethical challenges with being researchers and public pro health professionals today. With this in mind, let's talk a little bit more about the advocacy landscape. We often overcomplicate our view of advocacy, not understanding that it's all around us. Global institutions such as, as the United Nations and the World Health Organization challenge countries to respond to crises and opportunities and build consensus. In different ways, funding agencies such as the United States Agency for Development, International Development, and its counterparts in other rich countries, and private foundations set pr priorities for action and support innovation. In each case, even these seemingly impenetrable entities are open to new information, new ideas, and the influence of public health professionals. Similarly, there are entry points at each level of a country's government, from the Ministry of Health and Finance to the governors and legislatures in the United States all the way down to the district and village level. Equally important are the professional associations, corporations, and private sector actors that can be influenced by strategic advocacy. The takeaway here is that no matter where you land professionally, there are many interconnected ways in which you can inform and guide public policy to protect and improve public health. So everyone in this room and everyone online is probably very familiar with theories of, ch of change. They're, the, they're the, in all of the fabric of the School of Public Health. The conceptual models we use, let's see, let's see, yeah, the conceptual models um, we use for achieving a collective vision. Advocacy is no different. Practitioners and scholars have put forward 10 that capture how change has happened and does happen through advocacy. The first five on the left, the global theories of change, represent worldviews about how change happens and the choices that we will make as we work to save lives million, millions at a time. The first is large leaps. It refers to seismic shifts that occur when the right conditions, good or bad, are in place. For example, one example is the civil rights movement, um, an, uh, an example of large leaps. Policy windows take advantage of opportunities such as new political leadership, new discoveries, imminent threats to put and imminent threats to push for policy solutions. Coalitions is pretty much self-evident. People come together to with shared beliefs around a common goal. Power politics focus on working directly with those who are in the best position to make change. And finally, regime theory focuses on partnerships with policy or decision makers. Tactical theories differ in that they're how you do the work. And they can, they're not mutually exclusive and be, can be used together to further an objective. In fact, my own experience supports the reality that if you want to be an effective advocate, you'll need all of them at some point in your journey. And you have to have the flexibility and dexterity and good sense to use them because the advocate's job is never done. At the top, we find our theories of change in the, setting agenda, above, the agenda setting bubble. And if the one we develop is successful, the objective that is, or the agenda, decisions will be made to formulate and adopt policy. That's when you have a party. 
Then the hard work comes of ensuring that the policy is implemented. And here's the secret. Some of the best advocacy simply focuses on making sure that people know about and act on a policy that already exists and that it doesn't just sit on a shelf or in someone's hard drive in the back office. Once that's done, it's time to evaluate whether the policy is having an impact or, and an outcome, and the one that we expected when we developed our theory of change. And if not, again, we make some choices. We make choices during times of both success and setback. Let's assume that the evaluation finds that the policy has no effect whatsoever. Sometimes that happens. Perhaps it's an easy fix. Going back to implementation, maybe somebody didn't do their job. I mean, I can't imagine that, but maybe that happened. Perhaps it's more serious and we need a different policy. What if it's a great success? What if it's the best policy and it's implemented perfectly? Well, we might have to go back to implementation to re replicate it somewhere else, to actually scale it up. We might use it to revise the policy to reflect what we've learned, or we might decide that we want to set an even more ambitious agenda. In 2000. 10, um, I was working with here, here at Hopkins with an initiative in, and partners in Uganda. Family Health International had reams and reams of research at that time that showed that it was safe, effective, and feasible for community health workers to provide uh, it, uh, injectables to, in their communities. But they had been knocking on the door of the Ministry of Health for, for years with that research having seminars, having workshops, and they were frustrated. So we came in and we talked with them about this, a similar process of thinking about where they could work with the government to push the policy forward. And we came up with a strategy that started with a field visit for the acting director of the, the group within the Ministry of Health that had oversight of that policy. We took him out into the field. We answered his questions. Together with FHI, we again presented the evidence but he got to talk to women and community leaders and community health workers, and he came back and said, I'll convene my, uh, my committee, the committee that will consider and perhaps pass that policy. That was our advocacy win. All we wanted him to do was convene his committee. The committee came together, district health officers came in and, and testified, gave witness that it was safe, feasible, and effective for community health workers, and they passed the policy. Now that all sounds easier than it, than it actually was. It was great until the, the government of Uganda disbanded the village health team program. So now we're back to st step one. It just goes to show that you have to keep thinking all along the way. So we did, we went back and figured out whether or not their policy needed to be adjusted, et cetera, et cetera. And then they started to introduce a new type of, uh, provision of Depo-Provera, DMPA subcutaneous, which was a game changer in that self-injection could possibly be part of the community health workers' arsenal and um, ability to, to serve people. So we went back again and went to see whether or not we could help community health workers utilize that new technology. So you get in this little tiny story, and there's a lot more details, setbacks and successes. Let me put it another way. As a public health advocate, we must always be looking at, at by, be asking ourselves what makes policies that relate to our work effective. So here's on this slide um, are a few uh, touch points for that uh, process. First, the policy must be visible, accessible, and transparent. And in our own country right now, you know that there's a lot of obf obfuscation and it's happening in countries all over the world. If a policy isn't well known to the, to the people and to the professionals, it won't be effective. Uh, you, almost, you must also know it, um, it must also be actionable. You need to be able to act on the policy at hand and there needs to be a measure of accountability. Anyone who's working on monitoring and evaluation will know that, that that's, that's key. We also need to be self-reflective. To what extent is our advocacy grounded in evidence and adaptability? Have we engaged the right people in power? Does our effort involve intended beneficiaries? And again, how will we measure success? In 2009, I joined a multi-country advocacy initiative within the Bill and Melinda Gates Institute for Population and Reproductive Health and the Department of Population, Family and Reproductive Health. That initiative, Advanced Family Planning, set out to answer two main questions. 
How can we increase political and financial support for quality contraceptive information, services, and supplies? And equally important, does advocacy make a difference? With partners in low and middle income countries, we field tested a smart approach, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, a relevant and time bound approach, adapting a management framework that's been around since the 1980s. The results of that approach and our application of it have been conclusive. The answer to both questions, can you increase political and financial support and does advocacy make a difference, are resoundingly yes. Since 2009, our, we and our advocacy partners have been successful in achieving 1,665 advocacy wins, probably more. Um, those are discrete policy change, changes that can be tied back to the use of the SMART approach. This includes allocation of over $80 million from national and local treasuries for family planning. That's a huge, huge result from advocacy. Over the last decade and with a long-term vision, advanced family planning has refined and mainstreamed this approach. It's been used beyond family planning to set nutrition and safe surgery policy, and we've applied it from capitals to communities. It's been grounded in the science behind advocacy and policy analysis. It's been refined to make it intuitive, easy to use, low cost, and in other words, sustainable, which is something I think we're all searching for and striving to attain. So that's um, the fastest I could possibly give you an overview of how we see advocacy um, within advanced family planning, but also within the Center for Public Health Advocacy. And with that, I'm going to transition uh, to Oying. There you go. Thank you, Beth. Okay. So, um, when I was at the Gates Foundation, I was there at the time when Bill decided to step down actively from Microsoft and to become much more engaged and active with the foundation. So that was the timing when I was there. And one of the first things that he criticized about his own foundation was said, why are we wasting our money investing? What is this policy and advocacy? It's kind of, what the hell is this, right? Why are we wasting our money in policy and advocacy? So that was one of the first questions that he raised. And um, of course, the policy and advocacy people, you know, got an arm, said, okay, Bill, I'm making a shortcut story here. You may have all the money in the world, but your investment is a drop in the bucket if you have to address all of these issues that you want to address all over the world. If you really want to make a difference, right, you need to engage in policy and advocacy and align with many others. Because your, our resource, it may be big, relatively speaking, but it's a drop in the bucket. And when Bell started going to the field, you know, he finally found out that the key to the Gates Foundation's success worldwide is increased investment in policy and advocacy to align, you know, with the priorities, you know, uh, of the Gates Foundation. So in effect, he came back and essentially said that policy and advocacy is one of my top priorities uh, in the Gates Foundation. Now I'm sharing this slide with you, not to make you cross-eyed, but this is typical, you know, at the Gates Foundation, you kind of cram, you know, a lot of information and data in one slide. But I wanted to share this with you because in my view, the biggest practitioner of policy and advocacy in the world and who takes it very seriously, in, including the implementation, the practice, and the evaluation is, in my view, I may be wrong, is the Gates Foundation. And I want to take you through how they think, you know, in terms of policy and advocacy. And this is through what they call the theory of influence. So Mark Sussman, the president of Global Policy and Advocacy, and country program, so it's also the chief strategist of the Gates Foundation, was, was in this room? No, in another room <laughs> several months ago, and he showed this, you know, and he was joking, he said, you know, I didn't want to make you all cross-eyed, but I just want you to see, you know, 
So if you look at that on the left side, the, the, those are the inputs, right? And reputation is one of them, you know? It's not always about money, right? It's about reputation, it's about the voice, leadership. So when, um, um, during my time there, I, when I was talking to Melinda, I remember Melinda took on family planning as her issue for her lifetime. I said that more than the money that the Gates Foundation is going to invest in more than alignment with other institutions and donors, what is more important is your voice. You know, your voice is much more important because if your voice is there and you're able to articulate it in ways, you know, that other people can agree with you, that would be much, much more uh, important. So your reputation, voice, you know, not just uh, uh, stuff time or investments. And then the key is like the smart approach, who are those decision makers that you need to reach, right? How are you going to influence them? What's the context? And who are the, constitu the constituents, the political base that you would need to develop, right? And then what are the third column there? What are your tactics, advocacy or communication tactics to make that happen? So I'm not going to go through all of this, but you can see you know, all the different ideas there. And then what are your intermediate outcomes, right? So evidence are used, capacity is increased, stronger champions built, stronger coalition built, agendas influence, and so on and so on, right? But at the end of the day, um, there are really only two big areas where you measure um, advocacy from their point of view. One is increased funding. And the other one is in the area of policy, either new policies or existing policies being implemented or policies, you know, uh, shaping the programmatic work. I will disagree with this uh, two areas. Um, if I were there, which I have, I tend to disagree sometimes, you know. I think what the AFP, which uh, Beth uh, leads, you know, it's much more advanced than the, than, than the way the Gates Foundation thinks. Because the AUP approach to, um, to evaluation goes beyond funding and policy. They actually follow, so if funding was increased, if this policy was done, what happened after that? Were the programmatic work that was done? If that was the programmatic work that was done as a result of the policy, did it actually have an impact? So what AP tries to do is follow through because if you just end with say, okay, we help increase funding, we change the policy, where the policy is implemented, it's not enough, you know, from my point of view. You can't do this follow through all the time, but I think you can do an evaluation which would allow that um, uh, to happen. So the center, let me talk about the Center for Public Health Advocacy uh, that is set up here now. And by the way, you can um, have a certificate in public health advocacy if you're an MPH or an MSPH or a PhD student here. Uh, Diane Coraggio is here, you know, talk to her. She's the person who's helping us uh, pull together so that you can have a certificate in public health advocacy if you graduate at uh, the Bloomberg School. But the Center for Public Health Advocacy essentially is built, you know, around the three pillars of the school, which is research, excellence in research, excellence in teaching, and excellence in practice. Probably many of you are not aware of that, but that's the three pillars of the school. Research, teaching, and practice. It used to be only research in the olden days, but now trying to balance you know, with the teaching and especially with, with practice. Again, how do we link science to advocacy so that we can promote public health in a very powerful way? How do we professionalize the practice and leadership in advocacy? And the center can also be a focal point. There are many institutions and centers which are doing advocacy here, from gun control to vaccine to family planning to you name it. You know, there's so many centers at Hopkins who does that. But there, we need to have a cross-pollinization of what we learn from each of those different silos where we have, where we have been affected. When I uh, announced at the Gates Foundation that I was um, leaving and coming back uh, to Hopkins, uh, a lot of my colleagues said, why would you do that? 
I said, because in my discussions with the dean, uh, he was open for me to come back to Hopkins and investigate whether it was possible to set up a center for public health advocacy. And that was the key for me. You know, that after many years, you know, of working at Hopkins and looking at what Hopkins can do, there needs to have some focal point for public health um, um, advocacy. So let me just end because I want you to have your Q&A for at least 20 minutes or more than 20 minutes with this uh, message. If you think you are too small to make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito. So I will end there and Beth and I are available for Q&A or for comments from any of you, including hopefully some people, you know, and the, the streaming that would send questions to, to Marianne. So we're available here. Then just a quick note to people watching on the live stream, you can tweet questions to us um, at American Health or um, send them directly to me at mamus at jeg.edu. No problem. Uh, thank you both very much for a really excellent talk. <laughs> I feel like I'm now an, an FM radio announcer. Um, thank you both very much for an excellent talk. Um, I wanted to ask you to expand on some of the themes that you brought up because um, I think all of us who do advocacy know that we never enter advocacy um, on a blank slate. There's always someone who's advocating for something that is, if not the polar opposite of what we want, is certainly conflicts with what we want. And we often have to advocate to change policies that are now existing that are not public health policies. So um, uh, especially in the fields you work in, I'm sure you face that. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you address that situation. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I think I think that uh, that you you're right in uh, addressing that element of advocacy, because it's not just about making policy change or setting a new policy. It's also about protecting policies that already exist, um, going up against opposition, and also just maintaining while things are happening around you. One of the one of the biggest challenges I I think for advocacy is that. Until very recently, and even still it's quite rare, advocacy is very project, projectized, that's a word. Um, it lives in projects that are, are very short duration. Or conversely, it's done by people who are doing it on the margins of their job. They're not full-time advocates paid to be adv advocacy experts. They're doing it because they care about an issue and they know that if they don't work effectively with government, they won't be moving an issue forward. Some of the things that, that, I mean, one of the answers to your question, and it's very ad, ad, advanced family planning specific, is that we've been around for 10 years. We had a period in Tanzania where we were doing extraordinarily well in getting budget allocations from the national government, having the president be supportive. We were doing all sorts of things that were very um, influential. And then the president changed, and he has a different opinion about contraception. So right now, and, and also about civil society, the environment for civil society is a very important uh, component in, in answering your question, because sometimes they're at threat. Advocates are at threat, and they have to lay low. So right now, we're doing our best to do what we can, but it's it's very much in a different posture than we were before. And it goes back to that, that cycle of advocacy. Sometimes you have a setback and you have to move forward. And it looks like mm -hmm. Oyeng has something to say and add. So that's a um, really excellent question in the context of how you address advocacy. So let me tell you this uh, story. Um, when I was at the Gates Foundation, um, at that point in time, Melinda has still not come out publicly. What is the issue for her lifetime? For Bill, it was very clear. It was polio eradication and vaccines also. So um, 
um, I set up uh, learning sessions for Melinda on the issue of family planning and reproductive health. The first learning session that she had was actually in this building. Um, I contacted the then director of the Gates Institute, Dr. Amy Choi. I said, can you gather eight or 10 experts on the following topics? Melinda is coming and she wants to engage, you know, she would just want to ask questions, right? So that's kind of the, the cognitive part of it, right? There's also an effective part for it. You know, the effective part is when you actually go to the field and meet the women, you know, and all that. Okay. So to make a long um, story short, um, one day, uh, the person was uh, very close to Melinda, who was mostly drafting many of their ideas when they make major speeches. Um, and said, Oying, um, and he, he was a close personal friend. He said, Oying, don't, uh, where are you on this day? I said, well, I'm probably be in Europe. He said, don't stay, stay because we would have been back um, um, from the field, you know, and uh, I want you to be, uh, to be around. So I said, can you tell me? He said, no, but I have some inkling already because Melinda, bless her heart. Uh, one time he said, oh, Ying, I know what you're trying to do, right? And she said, if you want me to consider championing the issue of family planning, reproductive health, I want to meet all of those who are opposed to it. And we did that. We did that. I gathered, we invited people who were actually stringently opposed to family planning. And she met with all of them. Not all of them, but with a representative sampling of them. And she asked questions and she listened, you know, and then she went to the field. And when she came back, um, this was after some time, she, uh, the person on the stage with her was this person who I was telling you. And I said, Melinda, you just came back. We just came back from a trip to, to Kenya in one of the slums of Kenya, in Kurugutso, actually, one of the most difficult places to work with. And Melinda said, yeah. And when I was there, and purely there was no setup or anything. There happens to be there was a health clinic there that was not functioning, but a private sector institution went there, every, goes there every now and then to provide uh, injection, you know, and other uh, uh, contraceptives. So she went there, and there were forty women who were waiting for services there, and she talked to almost all of the forty women. I still remember the one who was so vocal. We call her the woman in red sweater, you know, because she was wearing red and you remember it. And Melinda, at that point in time when she came back, she said that, I know this is a controversial topic. I know some of you may probably question me or oppose me, but I have come to my decision that my issue for my lifetime is family planning. And let me tell you why. You know, then she goes into a rationale and said essentially that I know that it's not easy. It is difficult. I could have picked a topic where there is no controversy. But that's what we are here for. That's what the foundation is here for. To be able to take a look, you know, and tackle some of the more difficult, um, difficult issues. So as a follow up to that, and yes, very short story. She was going to test essentially how she would frame this globally, and the idea was to start it in Europe, you know, and move there. So, uh, and you can, uh, you, if you Google this, you would say a beautiful speech. So this speech that she it's developed, a TED talk. it's a TED, TED talk, by the way, <laughs> your speech that you develop, I always go back to it and get inspired, actually. And um, she shows, she starts with a series of pictures of couples. So a couple here, a couple, they're from different regions of the world. And then she asked the question, she said, um, what do you think is common among all these people, all these couples? It's kind of pause for dramatic effect, right? So people are like, I said, well, they all have sex, including this couple. And then she showed her and Bill, you know, she said, including this couple. So I don't know why this is so controversial. 
there should be no there should be no controversy about this, right? But so that's the way you know she framed it and took on the task. Potentially, it could have been a reputational risk for the foundation because it's not an easy place. There are people who are opposed to it, you know, who believe um, otherwise. So that's one way, you know, of addressing this. Just one short story. Uh, there was a, a grant, a joint grant by a Canadian government, a Canadian organization in the Gates Foundation and its IV. Okay. But there was a change in the leadership of one of the key organizations in Canada. It turned out that she came from the tobacco industry. To the Gates Foundation, that's a no-no, right? So the person running that, that uh, grant, uh, that's like entry-level position at the Gates Foundation, which is called an associate program officer. Right? She closed the grant. She closed the grant. And I said, yeah, I'm nervous. I don't know whether I have the power to do that. No, I said, you have the power to do that as associate program officer, right? It was on the front page of New York Times. I said, if the Gates Foundation, it's true to what it believes, the Gates Foundation will support you 100%. And she was supported 100%. I knew there were some powerful people who reached either Bill or Melinda, but the Gates Foundation stuck, stuck to it. So you could address controversy, you know, just have to be smart about it. Yeah. Do we have any more, Marianne, from the from online? Um, we do, actually. Um, so this is a two-part question. Um, the Marianne. first, oh, can you, yes, better, okay. Um, Question number one, how does this emphasis situate Bloomberg as an institution in advocacy opportunities? Does it become a greater imperative for the school to practice what it teaches, and how will that work be organized? Question number two is um, interested in knowing how the center is thinking about extending capacity building to inviting collaborations from the broader Baltimore community, particularly disenfranchised communities. How do we get the center vibrant in our own backyard? Do you want to come in? You're going to have. To. So we we um, when we first started trying to put together the Center for Public Health Advocacy, we soon realized we thought there might be other schools of public health that were out there that were thinking of the same thing and that were thinking that advocacy should be a part of the the curriculum and the the three pillars: teaching, practice, and research. And we found that. There were some that were kind of thinking about it, but nobody was doing it in the way that we were doing it. And no other school of public health was really even on the brink of acknowledging that advocacy needed to be part of your public health, um, the pro public health profession. And it's we've been working on this for for many years now, and it it's growing. It, it, at first, it was kind of slow, and and now it's it's picking up steam. In terms of of the question about Baltimore. It's not up to the center to necessarily do that. We are already doing that in a number of parts of the school. We have a lot of projects and, um, and centers that are doing advocacy that involves the Baltimore community and beneficiaries and communities around the world. What we don't have is an acknowledgement that when, as they're doing programs and as they're advocating, that advocacy is, is an equal partner in that dynamic. And that's what the center is trying to do. We're trying to, to um, do that. And we're also trying to be a pioneer. So we're trying to push the envelope in monitoring and evaluation, in different methodologies, in bringing together all of the knowledge that's been developed in the advocacy field to Hopkins so that we can be not only the best public health professionals, but the best advocates um, as well. And I know you have something to say about this. So maybe... I can say this, I think, because uh, the dean may have already announced it. But the Center for Public Health Advocacy um, got, or will get, or got, I don't know actually, uh, endowment from, the, from, from Bloomberg. Um, it's a new one, right? And this would be to support the center in terms of the operational uh, things that it needs to do which means that it has to be consistent with what the um, Bloomberg American Health Initiative should be doing, right? 
what the center would be doing in relation to uh, guns, working with the with our own center here, with opioids, you know, with obesity, you know, with adolescent uh, health. Um, so it, I'm not exactly sure when that would be operationalized. We are in the process of recruiting a new uh, director for center of the center. Um, I think the dean will announce uh, hopefully who the new director is in the next month or two, right? But part of that um, Bloomberg um, endowment uh, also um, would include uh, the development of case studies that could be taught here, and it could include case studies about Baltimore in the, in the same areas, you know, five issues. So that what we can develop in terms of case studies can actually be taught, you know, here at the School of Public Health. And in fact, uh, Diane, uh, there's a person coming in, right? And soon that we will have faculty members attend uh, this so that we can actually be introduced to how you develop a case study a la Harvard Business School type, you know? And then we use those case studies in the way we teach advocacy here. And to some degree, in my opinion, it would involve, you know, uh, issues which has to do with Baltimore. So in a way, it's an indirect way of addressing those types of issues. Yeah. I'll just follow up real quickly and say that if there are any faculty in the room who are interested in um, learning how to teach using case studies or learn to create their own case studies, um, we will have somebody here from Harvard University in the spring, in May. Um, and if you're interested in that, um, you can let me know and I can give you more information about that. Any other questions here in the room or comments? So thank you for that talk, both Beth and Noying, and I know that we're at time, but to the point of um, the Bloomberg American Health Initiative and advocacy specifically around those issues, I wanted to know um, how do you handle adv advocacy in high, um, it, with issues such as gun violence, where the debate has the science, the evidence, the stories all around it, um, environmental challenges, you have those same stories. So all uh, inclusive of the five focus areas, how do you begin to advocate advocate when you have the research that supports that to your point of research and teaching and practice how do you do that in a space where the emotions and individuals may feel that their their constitutional rights are being violated by the way you're advocating for some of these policy changes can you talk a little bit about that well, I have a very parochial view because we've been field testing something that seems to work. And the first, the first element of it is bringing together a coalition of the willing and the interested and those people who, who want to move an issue forward. And then they bring in all the, the, the things you were just, just, and they review everything you've just been talking about. But what, what's really important is that they figure out what kind of decision maker, and, and Oying touched on this, the decision maker, the person in power that's most accessible to them to influence. What's the first step toward whatever they want in a long-term goal? And I think that's what sometimes we get wrong. We, we don't realize that you have, to, you have to break it down to all the components and you have to celebrate your victories all along the way because advocacy is, not, is a pretty thankless job. But if you have a, a really specific or smart objective at the outset, and you get a you get a win, and you know what the next thing is, and you keep coming together, and you keep strategizing, bringing in champions. Um, Oying's talked a lot about Melinda Gates, but there are champions everywhere. Bringing in the right person to make that ask to a person in power, not always going in as the advocate, because advocates think that that if they just say it enough times, often that somebody will change their mind. Well, we don't actually change minds like that, or we don't change our own minds like that. So you've got to market it in a way that someone can hear it as well. If they care about something that's, that's somewhat related to your issue, connect the two. And we, that's what we do in advanced family planning. We do a lot more, but, but I think that's the best answer to your question. Be a little strategic about it and take the time to build consensus and, and come up with a real strategy. When you're dealing with a well-funded, you know, um, opposition, tobacco industry or gun 
industry. It's a di- kind of a different ball game, you know. Uh, your usual methods of advocacy, being nice, you know, and all that science and all that will have to be. Hey. You have to add other things. <laughs> you have to add other things beyond your evidence, right? So let me tell you this, uh, because this actually happened um, when um, tobacco control was being. Uh, um, introduced in a big way, taxation for cigarettes in Indonesia. You know what was the vicious campaign against it? Was that it's being promoted by Bloomberg. You know what? Bloomberg is Jewish. We are a Muslim country, right? The tobacco industry spread that, okay? Said, so why would want want the Jewish people you know, to dictate our, our, on our tobacco industry? It could be as vicious as that. Well, what was the counter? Muhammadiyah, the largest Islamic organization in Indonesia with lots of learned people there, came back, you know, and they issued a fatwa on tobacco. So there you are, you know. That's one way of doing it, right? So um, one area I think that we need to learn and learn more is the, in the, in the effective area. Evidence is important, but you have to tell your story. If you're not able to tell your story in a very compelling way and the others can, you lose, right? I still remember, because again, I, sorry for talking about this. One time, um, Bono was on the, the, on the stage you know, with Bill, Melinda, and I think Warren at the Gates Foundation. And he was asked a question by one of the staffers. He said, so Bono, you're so really good at this. What is the skill that you think you can learn more as an advocate? And Bono did not hesitate. He said, you know, I want to learn more about storytelling because we can have all the evidence, but it's the way you tell your story that really connects. And then Melinda stood up and said, yeah, I want to learn more about storytelling too. So because that's the emotional side. You know, when you're dealing with an issue in which you have very strong opposition, you know, it's cognitive is just not enough. You have to have your effective arguments and storytelling is part of that, yeah. All right, thank you everyone. I think we're at time and uh, we're signing off.